Thank you so much to the American Bar Association, to the Commission on the Status of Women, to Bobby and all of the, uh, the commissioners. Uh, this is a, a discombobulating uh, honor. And uh, all thanks and, and praise has got to go not only to the ABA and the Commission, but to uh, those who are my mentors, my heroes, my role models. And many of them are here today. Some could not be here. Uh, women and, and Brent honorees, such as Herma Hill Kay, uh, such as Her Hatness Drew Ramey, um, <laughs> to associations like the Bar Association of San Francisco. I'm biased, but it is the most fabulous bar association in the country. To the Legal Aid Society of San Francisco, to California women lawyers, to everyone in this room who is Really, this award is a collective award, and everyone in this room and so many people, so many women outside this, this room deserve it. I'm indebted to my family, to my parents, Don and Liz Cabral. My dad passed on, but he taught me the dignity of all work and that everyone matters. And my mom, who has a wicked wit and a big heart, they forgot to tell me there were things I couldn't do. Um, my life partner of over 30 years now, Marguerite Longton, and our kids, our son Renee and our daughter Francesca, they're all grown up now and off on their own adventures. My brothers and sisters, hi Robbie. Uh, and my original mentor, my original boss, Bob Leaf, the Leaf and Leaf Cabraser, has been my law partner for over 30 years, and uh, nobody told him about the glass ceiling either, and I'm glad. My present and former partners who are here today who are always on the cutting edge of social and economic justice, uh, who have enabled me to do anything I've been able to do, and who are taking the practice of law and the cause of justice so much farther uh, than I ever dreamed of. Thank you. Um, now for a story. Once upon a time, my Folks used to take us five kids on treks through the Sierra Gold Country. We would comb the wrecks and ruins of boom towns and mining camps. These were summers of cheap thrills and rich history. My favorite place was always Virginia City in Nevada, silver town clinging precariously to the desert foothills, home to penny slot machines and the infamous Bucket of Blood Saloon, featuring what my mom insisted were the world's oldest living cocktail waitresses. I love them. Amidst this wild and woolly scene was a little wedding cake of a courthouse with a statue of justice over the door. She was awesome. She had the scales, albeit a bit unbalanced, but she wore no blindfold and she favored her sword. In my vision of the law, she was my totem. I've since learned that representations of justice without her blindfold are scarce. There's maybe 20 of them around. Convention favors serene and sightless justice, calmly holding scales aloft. Her sword, which stands, by the way, not for violence, but for the often uncomfortable and disconcerting truth, rests at her side. Her blindfold supposedly means impartiality and objectivity, but it was obviously of no use to justice in Virginia City, where eyes wide open is the key to survival. And although we know that physical blindness is no impediment to true vision, I wonder if that commonplace blindfold may be similarly dysfunctional today, signifying not equality, but complacency, hinting at a wishful or a wistful blindness. Or even worse, does it portend to justice blindness and held hostage by forces of wealth and power, a justice who cannot see that her scales are still uneven. Now, I'm in the litigation field. It's my day job. And I know there are many judges and perhaps opposing counsel in the room who are worried that at any moment I'm going to start citing and quoting from some landmark decision of the day and some controversy. Uh, you needn't worry. I am not going to talk about the festering inter-circuit split regarding federal pleading standards in the wake of the Supreme Court's Twombly and Iqbal decisions 
although I know, I know that's what you really want to hear. I have to cite or quote something, though. So I'm going to revert to a childhood jump rope line. Maybe some of the Girl Scouts remember this one. Fudge, fudge, call the judge. Mama's got a newborn baby. It ain't no boy. It ain't no girl. It's just an ordinary baby. We all come into this world as ordinary babies, and then we get sorted by gender, by color, by orientation, and by beliefs. And the things that we can't change or the things that are most, we're most proud of limit and restrict some of us. That's not justice. It needs to change. Everyone in this room works daily, I know, to change that because until we are all ordinary and we have ordinary rights and opportunities, none of us can become extraordinary. So to all of you, thank you for using your extraordinary powers and efforts to make sure that anyone can achieve greatness. Now, we have a role model, we have an ideal of justice, and she is a woman, but I would respectfully suggest that the way to get where we need to go on the long struggle for justice is not to line up in an orderly fashion behind the statute of justice with the scales thus so and the serene expression looking like she's just come back from a full day at the day spa. I would refer you to my Virginia City justice and indeed, if you look in your booklet to the inside front cover, you'll see Brooksley Bourne's justice. She's one of those 20 existing statues of justice in the world, we think, without that blindfold. And as we go forth, I would suggest that we arrange ourselves in a somewhat disorderly fashion around this justice, the justice of Margaret Brent, the do-it-yourself, don't take no for an answer justice, the she's no lady justice, an ordinary woman striding forward, wide-eyed with a sword. Thank you very much.